Hello, do you remember me? I feel like I can hardly remember myself by this point because it's been so long since I have filmed a video. And honestly, that's because I quit YouTube about five times during the time since I haven't made a video. And I kind of thought I've been doing this for eight years now. Do I still want to do it? Have I got anything to talk about? Do people really want to listen to me going on about books? And does my opinion matter? Does any of it matter? I mean, I'm just standing in front of a camera talking about books. <laughs> and so I kind of wavered back and forth, like, I'm not sure what's happening. I have been doing my university degree and that's been taking up a lot of my time as I completed my final projects, which are now done, I am pleased to say. And I also just published my third book, Bookishly Ever After, the third and final book in the Paper and Heart Society series, which I've been working on for five years now, since I was 16. And that was a huge monumental thing to finish the series that I've been working on for so long. And so I felt like I had a bit of an identity crisis and I was just trying to think, you know, what do I want to do with my life? And what changed my mind was that I read a book and I thought, I have got to talk to someone about this because I love it so much. I think it might be one of my favorite books of all time. And I haven't got anyone to talk about books with. If I don't make YouTube videos, who in my life am I going to talk to about all these amazing books? How am I gonna get other people to read them too? <laughs> so here I am, I'm back. You didn't lose me for that long, but it was kind of close. I think, you know, that's not a problem to admit. I think COVID has made us all reevaluate our lives and what we want with our lives and a lot has changed. And I think that's a very healthy thing. But here I am, <laughs> you couldn't get rid of me. One of the reasons for my big identity crisis was that I haven't been reading that many classics. I've read a few this year. I've read as many as I wanted to because I always try to read at least one a month. And I think I've pretty much done that so far this year. So it's not a problem but I kind of felt like oh if I'm not reading 10 classics a month then what's the point in making YouTube videos because people are going to get upset that I haven't read enough or I'm talking about the same books and it kind of blew my mind so I've scaled everything back and I've gone to a system where I'm just reading what I want to do and that has involved some classics and I've been reading a lot of romance books that I can read in like a day and I've been revisiting series that I read when I was a teenager and things like that I've just been reading what I wanted to but then in the last month or so I have read some seriously good books so whilst there are fewer of them I hope I can convince you to read them and I also thought to make up the video and to make it a bit longer so I'm not just in and out I'll do a small summer TBR and show you some of the classics I'm hoping to read this summer. So this is the book I want to talk to you about it is called The Call and it's by Edith Ayrton Zangville and it was published by Persephone Books who have books that look like this and I've been reading lots of Persephone's books recently they have recently moved bookshops from London to Bath and I cannot wait to venture into a bookshop for the first time in so long and get to visit their new shop because I loved it when I visited their shop in London a few summers ago. It would be a few summers ago now with Covid but they have moved to Bath and that's really exciting because they're right on my doorstep. So I put in an online order before they moved and got lots of lovely books from them and the call, oh my god, I cannot tell you how much I love this book. I think it might possibly be one of my all-time favourite books now. I am obsessed with it. I want everybody to read it. Please read it so we can all sit down and discuss it and I can tell you how amazing it is and you can find out for yourself. Oh, it's so good. So I've been reading lots of suffragette themed books recently. This is a theme with this video, a slight theme with this video, because I am writing a book about the suffragettes. And you know, I used to love the Brontes. Well, I feel like I still love the Brontes, but the obsessiveness 
has switched over to the suffragettes because I'm deep in research for the book that I'm writing. I have loved it so much. There are things I've discovered about the suffragettes that I never knew that I wanted to bring into the story, elements that I think are very surprising. And whilst I certainly don't agree with everything they did, I think it's a really important part of women's history in the UK and also worldwide as there were so many other suffrage movements. And so I think it's really important to study it, understand it, see where the women were coming from, but at the same time you don't always have to agree with everything they did. Because in later lives they really were terrorists, they were blowing things up, they were bombing buildings, setting fire to buildings, and if people were going around doing that now you can imagine what the reaction would be. So that is what I've been trying to do, trying to get a balanced opinion on these women thinking about the good things they did, thinking about the bad things they did and what the cause led to. So I read The Call thinking it was just going to be a book that I read for research, thinking I might enjoy it, but it really was just there for me to get a sense of what suffragette literature was out there, written quite recently after women had gained the vote. But then I started reading it and I thought, Oh wow, I love for this book. This is about a young woman called Ursula who at the beginning of the novel is a scientist. You can imagine what being a scientist and being a female scientist was like at this period in the early 1900s. She is certainly one of the only women in her field and because of this she gets looked down upon by the men, her opinions aren't valued as much as if she was a man speaking and it's quite frustrating for her. But she tries her best, she's always locking herself away in her home laboratory to find out new things and prove her theories right. And then Ursula, despite the fact that at the beginning of the novel she is totally against against the suffragettes and doesn't understand what they're doing whatsoever, she decides to join them and she gets involved in the campaign for women's suffrage, votes for women. And so we learn about everything from meetings to protests to being put in prison and hunger striking. And there is also a crossover in the novel with the First World War. So it's a suffragette and a war novel. So Edith Ertensangel's father remarried when she was 10 years old and her new stepmother encouraged her to join join the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, which was headed up by the Pankhurst, and together they formed the Jewish League for Women's Suffrage and became leading members of the United Suffragists. I'm not sure if this has pushed Shirley from the top spot of my all-time favourite books, but it is very close, it is very close, because I love this. I wish I could erase my memory and reread it again for the first time, because that would be amazing. I know it looks slightly as if I have picked up the same book again, but I promise you I haven't. This is another Persephone books, and this time we have Despised and Rejected by Rose Alatini. This was a very controversial novel that got banned in its time, not because the main characters are gay and a lesbian, but because it talks about the war and pacifism. So this was published in 1918, right after the end of the first World War so it deals with very recent events and I suppose I would call it an early coming out novel because it very much deals with those feelings when you realise that you're not straight but it was written a hundred years ago at a time when books like this couldn't have happy endings. Ian Forster for example wrote Morris and he talked about how it was really important for him to have a happy ending because it just wasn't encouraged. It was seen as really bad in novels like this. If you had a couple that went straight or a relationship that wasn't straight and everything turned out okay at the end. I don't think it's a perfect book. I think the plotting was a bit all over the place in places, the pacing was a bit off, I wasn't always sure about the writing, but the story and its place within the queer canon of literature means that it's such an important book to read and I think if you can look past those issues of plotting and pacing then you'll really enjoy it because I know that I did. So those are the two classics that I have read recently. I may 
not have read loads and loads but the two I read were so good that I knew I had to talk to you about them and would really recommend reading them. Please do so we could have lots of conversations about them. And now I'm going to show you a few of the books that I am hoping to read this summer. I'm going to try to read lots and lots this summer because I have more time to read but also I'm trying to clear out a lot of my book collection because I'm trying to clear some space in my bedroom so that's the thing that's happening so I want to read a lot of the books that I think I'm going to read once and then are probably going to get rid of so I'm not really sure how classics fit into that because I tend to keep the classics that I read so I can discuss them so I can go back to them so I can refer to them at any point so I tend to keep the classics so I'm hoping it will kind of be equal on classics and other books but we will see and the first classic I would like to read which I am already reading is No Surrender by Constance Maud which is another suffragette book I am 62 pages into this and there isn't actually actually a lot of suffragette literature that was written at the time which is very surprising because there were many suffragettes who were writers as well but there's not a lot out there so I'm trying to read as many as I can. This book concentrates on two characters. There is Jenny who is a working mill girl who gets involved with the suffragettes and another character who is kind of a minor aristocrat who everyone discourages from becoming a suffragette but their lives become intertwined and they get to know each other and meet and I haven't got any further than that but it's very interesting with the opinions that it expresses or the anti-suffrage sentiment which is really great to read. It's good to read why people join the suffragettes but also interesting to know why they didn't and why people didn't agree that women should get the vote. And I also like how it focuses on a working class mill girl because we have this image of the suffragettes as all middle or upper class women but that certainly was not the case and so whilst Constant Maud probably wasn't writing from her own experiences. I still think it's very interesting to see how she portrays that and many of the characters in this are based on real life suffragettes and Constance Maud herself was involved so she is writing right in the middle of the movement and that makes this really interesting. So like I said I am 62 pages in but I'm hoping I will finish this soon because I am really enjoying it. Then we have Summer by Edith Wharton which I want to read this summer because it's called summer I feel like I have to read it in summer but I wanted to read it last summer and I never got around to it and so it's got to be this summer because otherwise I'll put it off until next summer so this summer will be the one it's quite a short book for Edith Wharton I've certainly read longer books by her and I think it's going to be a sad one so I will have to prepare myself for that because she's broken my heart too many times already this was regarded by Edith Wharton as one of the best of her novels which is very interesting because I certainly do trust her judgment I have read quite a few of her books so far I've read quite a few of her short stories as well and I love her the love just keeps growing for Edith Wharton with every single book of hers that I read and so I'm really hoping that I enjoy this. I think I will and I'm just wondering now if as soon as I finish filming this video I can start reading it. Then in lieu of going on holiday this year which in Covid is just not something that I'm interested in I am going to travel back to Victorian Wales instead and I would like to read Torn Sails by Alan Rain. This is not a book that you will hear talked about a lot or you'll see people reading a lot because it's just a book that's been forgotten and Alan Rain is an incredible writer that nobody talks about anymore. She sold millions of copies and then went out of print and everybody forgot that she existed which I think is a crying shame because I love her writing so much and Torn Sales is set in a Welsh coastal village and she's really great at picking up those tiny details about how people lived which is something I'm very interested in. I love the social history behind the books. I love thinking about the way that the characters lived and what that says about how people lived at the time which to me is the best thing about reading classics. She is the most 
beautiful writer and I'll leave a link in the description to where you can read the book online because they are quite difficult to get hold of now so you either have to look for second-hand copies or read them online which you can download to your Kindle or your phone which is what I do. And then finally I would like to read Beatrix Potter's Letters. I love Beatrix Potter, I've loved her since I was a tiny tiny child. I think that she is the best and when I've been feeling a bit anxious or stressed or I can't sleep I just pick up something of Beatrix Potter's, either her stories, the fairy caravan or her letters and I instantly feel calm again. <laughs> it's just my coping mechanism and I've been doing it lately because I wasn't sleeping very well and I thought if I read Beatrix Potter, I think it's going to quieten my brain. And you know what? It worked. The nights I didn't read Beatrix Potter, I didn't sleep. And the nights that I did, I slept like a baby. So there's some advice for you. This is a collection of her letters that I bought. They have been selected by Judy Taylor, who I think also wrote a biography of Beatrix Potter. And this isn't the best edition, but I do like how it has facsimiles of the original letters so you can see what her writing looked like. She led a very fascinating life from a child right through to an adult and I'm always finding something new not just in her stories but in her life too and ever since I read a biography of her about a year or two ago I fell in love even more and it's really nice to rediscover an author that you loved as a child and find that there is still more to learn and to love. There is something really intimate and lovely about reading a collection of letters you really feel like you get to know that person and their voice which is something that I am really into. So I'm hoping that those won't be the only books that I read this summer. I certainly have intentions to read more but hopefully I'll have some more reading wrap-ups coming up over the summer where I can share with you what I read as I read them. So let me know in the comments what you have been reading recently because I would really love to know and thank you so much for watching this video. Happy reading!